and start the uh, the panel with the comic book creators. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for showing up and showing out, and uh, you know being a part of this. Uh, we've worked really hard. These people have been in the industry for some time, and you know it's 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 incredible what comic books can do for people. Uh, it's incredible what you know, just like any form of literature, getting it into people's hands, whether whether it's a comic book, whether it's a novel, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, it, it, it's really important that people you know read these stories and, and feel the the art that is you know being produced by these people uh, visually and through words. So let's give a hand of uh, a round of applause to our, uh, our comic book creators. And uh, you know, so. Uh, moderating the panel will be uh, our dear friends Peter Melnick and Eddie Wilson of The Marvelists, a very, very popular podcast. Uh, make sure you check them out. But uh, without further ado, I'll let them uh, introduce themselves and we'll get the panel started. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, guys and gals. Uh, this is Peter Melnick and I'm Eddie Wilson. Hi there. And we're The Marvelists, a uh, podcast that's been uh, out there since January of 2018, uh, primarily based on the movies. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe that were leading up to Infinity War and, of course, Endgame. Uh, I think that was the uh, genesis of it. Well, no, Infinity War well, was supposed to be Iron Man 2, Infinity War, and then we would have had nothing for three months, and then we are like, oh yeah, we should do other stuff. So, But that was the idea, I think, I think the inception of, hey, why don't we base it off of, you know, and went from there. Uh, but we want to introduce our three comic book creators that are here, I think starting on your left and mine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you've seen, if you've been through here, you've seen some of their work that they've had out here. Um, Blood Realm being his most current, I believe, Robert Geronimo. Cool. <laughs> Several titles to his credit, including uh, Coyotes, El Guapo, Agent of Dump, Saints, The Few, and I think the most recent, Thumbs, Sean Lewis. Controls <laughs> uh, and Clean Killers also. And uh, who's dabbled and worked in some names that you've heard of, such as DC, Marvel, and also Archie Comic Publications, and Back Issue Magazine, and also teaches at SUNY Orange, Al Nickerson. And a clipboard. <laughs> we don't have to get off a clipboard. That's, that's just, oh, come on. It's a teaching tool. Okay. So, I don't know, you want to maybe just begin with um, how long you've been doing what you're doing, and, and why you're doing what you're doing, if that's uh, a possible... Uh, Oh, jumping point, starting point, Robert. Can everyone hear me? If you want to just probably pull the microphone out and pass it back and forth, okay. that's probably going to be I don't want easier. To bring here we go. Okay. Testing. Good. Yeah. Oh, so, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Um, how long you been doing what you're doing, and, and why? Oh, boy, uh, I've been doing comics independently and uh, publish stuff for about 10 years. I absolutely love comics and that's why I do it. I live and breathe comics. Uh, comics got me through a lot, particularly through high school. <laughs> so I feel like I, I need to give back to the comic book medium and tell stories of my own. Um, I've been in the industry now for, I'm going on my fourth year, um, though I tried getting in much earlier and had a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing medium. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's like Christmas every time I get art from an artist. So that's why I keep doing it. Oh, uh, um, I've been working in comics since 1994. I work for uh, Marvel and DC and Archie. I was an animator for Nickelodeon, Sesame Street, and TV animation. Uh, now I'm self-publishing the Sword of Eden graphic novel. Uh, yeah, comics is a powerful literary form, and I think it's wonderful that nowadays that a lot of people are seeing that. Uh, and in comics should be uh, a forum where we're actually talking about very serious things and very important topics. What uh, what influences did either of you guys, all of you guys, have to make you say, you know what, this is what I want to do? Mm. Like who you really like growing up and. Who your, who your favorites are, and maybe who maybe some of your own work you kind of loosely based on. And also like the first book in general for you guys each. Oh, okay. First comic. <laughs> All right, well, the first comic for me was, I don't remember the exact number, but it was Superman. There was a silhouette of him bursting through these chains. The Neil Adams one, I think, with the uh, green kryptonite green. chains? Yes, yeah. that's the one. Unbelievable cover. And that's when I was like, wow. Um, it looked like he was bursting through that in real time. Not before 
the moment or after the moment. Like it literally looked like it was happening right before my eyes. And then when I opened up the comic, it was like moving pictures. And I was sucked in that day forward. I was like, wow, this is like a movie. This is moving as I'm turning the page. But I didn't actually uh, read the comic when I was a kid. I kind of just uh, used my imagination, you know? So sometimes like, I didn't actually know who Doomsday was. I kind of made my own little story. So I was a little disappointed because you know, it doesn't match the imagination. <laughs> but it was still really awesome. And, and uh, I fell in love with it from uh, Superman, that issue. Um, I don't remember the first one, but I was really, really obsessed with this run of X-Men comics of Chris Claremont and John Byrne. Um, they're the things I remember the most. I was a big geek who was really obsessed with Greek mythology, and I think when I started reading some of the Marvel comic books that were at my local like pharmacy, where, where I used to get them on the spinner rack, um, they just seemed like myths to me that I was watching these people who were like, I was obsessed with this character Colossus, basically like, he was just like what I wanted to be. He was tall, good looking, muscular, he had this pretty girlfriend, but he was also still sad. And I was like, that would be me if I was like tall and handsome and had a pretty girlfriend, I'd still be sad. This, this is everything I can imagine in my life. And, uh, and it just kind of stuck with me and that, that kind of stayed on and then through that I got obsessed with Image when, when those artists all left the books I was reading, I, I, I left with them and, and just kind of went on and then my uncle who runs Havens for Heroes, um, he was a big Vertigo fan and he stayed with us and I would just steal his comics and I would just be like, I'd be like this weird 12 year old bringing Swamp Thing to school and being like, read this! And people going like, we're not your friend anymore. <laughs> That's kind of a sad story. <laughs> I got the last laugh. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I don't know what the first comic I was. I do remember DC Comics. They had a Batman book called Detective Comics, and they had a backup story in there by Walt Simonson. It was written by uh, Archie Goodwin called Manhunter. And yeah, I'm old. Uh, and uh, that was great. But what really? But I was a huge Marvel fan growing up, and like you were saying about John Byrne's X Men. Like, that stuff had a huge impact on me. And Terry Austin's inks on that book, that, and I was talking to you earlier, that made me want to be an inker. So when I was in high school, I realized I, not only do I want to work in comics, I want to be an inker, I want to work for Marvel. And that had a huge impact on me. But when I got to college, and I had some wonderful teachers at college, uh, at the School of Visual Arts, um, I was introduced to other creators. Uh, like Will Eisner, uh, Dave, well, Will Eisner taught at the school, but also like people like Dave Sim, you know, on Cerebus and stuff. And like, the, a lot of the independent comics were like fantastic, and that just totally blew my mind. But yeah, in Image Comics, when all those guys wonderfully left Marvel, no offense, uh, and formed Image, that stuff was great. Like the Max, I thought was great, you know. Uh, yeah, Sam Keith is like fantastic. But those those were really my Jack Kirby, of course, uh, also a huge influence. Okay. With one of the current things that you're doing now individually, of course, like Robert for Blood Realm, uh, a little bit about the current thing that you're doing now, you know, the synopsis, what it's about, that kind of thing. Sure. Oh, it, it's a dark fantasy uh, comic series, which follows this war between the, this goat race and mankind. So each mini-series follows a different perspective of that war. I like to tell people that it's, it's a nice blend between, or a happy marriage, between Lord of the Rings and The Exorcist. <laughs> You're into that stuff. Right, right. It's a good book. Thank you. I'm right now publishing a book called Thumbs. Uh, Thumbs is basically a sci-fi book that imagines a future where uh, Mark Zuckerberg has kind of started giving away free technology to poor kids and is turning them into his own army against the United States. It's very cheery. <laughs> very good. We write, we write cheery books. <laughs> uh, right now, I'm self-publishing a graphic novel called The Sword of Eden. It actually just came out. I got all the books from my printer on Monday. Uh, it's a 220-page graphic novel. It has very strong Christian themes to it. Um, it starts off uh, with a 16-year-old girl who has superpowers, and she starts her career as a superhero. And she's think, she thinks she's doing God's will by fighting evil. Uh, and, but she has like an eye for an eye attitude for things uh, of the world, so she's kind of rough around the edges. And she goes on this adventure, and she meets these other superheroes, and they search for the, the Sword of Eden, uh, the sword that uh, the angels had used to keep men uh, out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and they try to find this sword, which they think is a very powerful weapon, but there's, there's these demons who don't want the heroes to find the weapon because they believe that if the heroes find the weapon, then 
uh, the world would have more evidence that God actually exists. So there's that conflict between the heroes and, and these demons. And then they try to search for Noah's Ark and all that fun stuff. Now in regards to each of what you guys do, what is the your favorite thing about what you do and the hardest thing about what you do? See all the gears turning. You guys might agree. I feel like the part that's most fun is formulating the idea, you know, before you actually have to do it. You know, it's like you're thinking about the possibilities and you're getting inspired, you're listening to music and you're imagining how epic this is going to be. And then the hard thing is finally just putting it on paper, really doing it for real this time, and then marketing it, promoting it. I would say the promotion part is very difficult. That's something that people don't really talk about too much, getting it out there and letting people, making everyone get excited about it. But that beginning stage is a lot of fun, right? <laughs> I'd say the beginning, I also like, I do mean it. As a writer, I, I can't draw. So for me, every time I get pages sent to me from an artist on something I wrote, that is still my favorite thing, because it's just like, it does feel like Christmas. There's also moments where I'm like, oh, they saved me. Like, I, I wrote something not very good, and it, it looks real. I can do something with this. Yeah, it's coming to life. <laughs> yeah, it's totally alive. And they've imagined it, honestly, in, I mean, it's a collaboration, so like, it's different than what I thought, but almost always I feel like it's better. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of this, or, Oh, the background's alive. I hadn't even thought of like the world they're in. I should probably do that. <laughs> um, well, to answer your question, there's like two different perspectives to look at this because you can look at it at the work made for hire situation when you're working for Marvel or DC and Archie. I can give you my opinions about that, but I'll probably refrain. But and Robin has what I'm talking about. But like from what I'm working on now with the sort of eating and self-publishing, I, I guess my favorite part is the inking. Like I still love inking. Like lay everything out in pencil and work in and brush and, and nib and inking. I think the hardest part, I mean, you mentioned promotion and when anyone's work, that's kind of difficult. I guess, like, when you're self publishing and you're writing and drawing your own work, I guess you got to be a bit of a control freak, and maybe that's kind of how I am. Um, yes, Pastor John would agree with that. Um, the thing is, is that, so the things that I can't control, like distribution, working with a printer, when those things are out of my hands and they're bombs, that freaks me out. Um, but yeah, working on your own stuff and like the inking part, I think is still my favorite. Part of making you know? I could concur with the inking real quick because I used to do very tight pencils when I was starting out, and it would be very stiff. So when I would finally ink my work, it would be it would lose the, the energy. So now what I started to do now. I love having rough pencils and then letting the magic happen in the ink. You know, so this way, there's a that life to me. So, so, so inking is drawing. Exactly. It's not right. just tracing, right? <laughs> of course it is, right. yes. <laughs> Actually, I want to go back to Al for something you touched on there. With your current work and having Christian um, overtones, undertones, or just theme, mm. is that something new for you? And on that, and I've seen some saints comic books. Marvel's put out a couple things, whether it was Mother Teresa or Pope John Paul II, St. Francis, that you find randomly, and, and I'm a catechist, so I teach this, as well, and if I find them, I'm grabbing them. Uh, is it is it a new area for you to get into with that overall thing theme? And do you see much, I don't know, proliferation of the Christian comic book type of thing? Uh, is it new? I, I don't know if it's new because it sort of even used to be a downloadable digital comic several years ago. So I wouldn't say it's new, um, but it's new in the sense that it's in the printed collected format that just came out. Um, it, it's it's weird because. I am being completely ignored by the secular comic book industry, uh, which, which is fine, you know, and I, I totally dig it. I, I totally understand that. So, but my audience is the church, you know, so when I connect to that, actually, it works out fine. The, but the good thing also, though, is that, I don't, well, I don't know if it's good or bad, but like the Christian comic industry, I don't know if there's really much of an industry in that, you know, I, I, there's not a whole lot of Christian comics out there, and if there are, they're not all that great and that sounds terrible. I would think that maybe it's getting the youth uh, to know about religion in this respect. Maybe if nothing else. Uh, not, not as a tool to read comic books, but it's got to be out there for... Well, I, I certainly think there's an untapped audience there. Um, and I, I think that's very true. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that 
exactly answers your question or not. But, but is it your first, if, you, if I missed it, I apologize, but uh -huh. is that your first foray into going that way, let's say, you know? Uh, well, this project maybe, I mean, because I spent decades, well, well, 20, 25 years, you know, working in secular comics, and I just got tired of working on Jughead or mm -hmm. drawing the Justice League and stuff. I don't, I'm sorry. Um, so I wanted to do something, and I've self-published stuff before, and I worked on creator-owned comics before, even like some of these uh, characters, but I, what I wanted to do was to give back to God and create something that had very strong Christian themes in it. So I think that's probably the genesis, really, of the Sword of Eden, even though some of those characters have appeared in print before. Gotcha. Now, Sean, you had mentioned that you're a fan of you know mythology and stuff like that, and would you say in the comic book industry, the stories that we get nowadays, like you know the DC stories, the Marvel stories, the Image stories, they're almost like today's modern day mythology, like a, you know how everyone knows Batman's origin, Superman, Spider-Man's, etc. I mean, I think at, at their best, yeah. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, I probably have like I, I teach a bit. And I'm like I, I'm sure I have more students who probably know about Superman's background than they do any Greek myth that I threw at them. Like I think if I threw at them, like tell me about Hercules, they just be like, no, no, not today. And if I say Superman, they're like, ah, oh, he's from another planet, and I don't know, he, he, he's a newspaper man sometimes? Like, they would know at least that much. It's gotten ingrained into our pop culture subconscious so Absolutely. much now. Well, because you, you, at any point, like, you've been a kid and you've seen, like, the animated versions, and then you're growing up and there's movie versions, and, like, it's just in front of you so much that, I, I, yeah. So I think, like, with those iconic characters, for sure. I think it's wild, though, that characters like Thanos now are household names, or my go-to one, Groot. People know who Groot is now, and... It is funny, like, I do think it's funny that I think, like, Worldstar will have, like, this girl goes Thanos mode, and I'm just, like, like for a video. <laughs> and I'm just kind of, like, it's very weird that this, like, Jim Starling, like, creation from a long time ago is, is, has, like, gotten that deep into the culture. I wonder how Jim would feel like Dreadstar became a thing. <laughs> but is that a good thing, though? You think? Like, I, I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful time for comics right now because it's, uh, for years and years and years, a lot of people looked at comic books and frowned on comics that it was just kid stuff. But now, I think people are having a lot more respect for comics. You have terms like, you know, the graphic novel or sequential or and that sort of thing, and I think that's actually kind of wonderful. Um, I think maybe like, like maybe like eight years ago, I was hanging out with some friends. And uh, one of the wives mentioned adamantium, and she never read comics before. And that's where it hit me that this stuff is part of pop culture now. So is it a good, it's, you know what, it's like your favorite band, and no one else listens to your favorite band now. Like, everybody loves your favorite band. It's kind of like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it's just like, but so I have very mixed feelings about it. But I think it's great that the general audience respects comics more. And that's how we can have events like this have, uh, you know, libraries put on events like this, and that's that's wonderful. So, uh, I think this is for Sean and Robert more so. I've gotten a chance at Haven to look at Blood Realm and I think Thumbs, and if I'm not mistaken, you've done them in black and white and red. Um, so, of course, why why go limited with those colors and, you know, the, the reasoning, that kind of thing, and what might be a good or not so good thing about it and how you utilize just that palette. So with Blood Realm, um, I wanted to make the reader feel as if they're reading an ancient text, and I felt like if it was fully colored, that it would kind of take away that aesthetic. So, you know, and the way it's designed too, it's not designed like a traditional comic book. It's very much, uh, I would say, a little bit retro, right? We were talking about the, the Swamp Thing uh, artwork. I've also, I also really like European comic artists like Sergio Tappi and stuff like that, Mobius. So. The limited palette, I feel, added to that illusion that this is some ancient manuscript that you just discovered somewhere, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, something like that. And the red, you know, that was actually a suggestion of Peter Sumetti. Originally, I was just going to do black and white, and he was like, come on, man, the title's called Blood Run. We have to get red in there. <laughs> so I said, you're right, you're right. And uh, I'm glad that uh, he decided to do it because it, it's much more eye-catching inside, and it's kind of become synonymous with the series now. I mean, I like what I love what you're saying in terms of like you want it to feel like a ta an ancient text. Like I think there's a lot about the fact that comic books are tactile, right? That you have to hold them. I think there's something like theatrical about them in the sense that like they can give you an experience when they're really thought about it. Like I, like I can make this like a scroll if I want if I want to. I mean, getting a black or white comic published at a publisher is like 
very hard. Like, they do not like it, because they do not believe that any of you will buy it. <laughs> like, we hear that immediately. So with Thumbs, I mean, we were, Hayden Sherman, who's the artist on it, we were talking about what's the experience of this book. So we were like, that's a book that it's a very dystopic world that is informed a lot by technology. So we were like, well, what if we go really muted color palette with the world itself, but every time technology shows up, it's in a bright neon color. So like there's these pinks and purples that kind of explode off the page. And they kind of work in like a, um, a, 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 a kind of bait and switch way. Cause you're like you're flipping through the book and it's, it's really muted and dour and dark. And then you go to like a splash page, which will be like a full page pen up of the action. And suddenly there's all this explosion of color coming off the page. It really does kind of lure you in and trick you where you're like, oh, this is making me sleepy. And then there's like an explosion of color when we really want to excite the reader. Um, Al, you worked in black and white also. Are we going to add something to that? Or? Um, no, I, I kind of like what you're saying, how color actually plays an important role in the art, not just to you know fill stuff in and put color in it. Uh, when you were just talking about color and the influence of color on, on work, I was reminded of like the Watchmen. Like, I can't remember the colors in the Watchmen, but he had that weird palette, the color palette in Watchmen, and that was a conscious choice on his part to use those kinds of colors, you know? So I think color does play a role in work. You know, like if you look at an Archie, well, a traditional Archie comics comic book, you know, you got more vibrant colors like reds and yellows and stuff, because the audience is for children, you know? But if you're tell, telling a dark, moody story, you're not gonna use vibrant colors, so you're gonna use more moody colors or, or no colors at all. So I think color does play a role, and I'm wondering, if that had, that was more of a decision, like towards the, you know, when Watchmen came out or even after that, where they started coloring comics in Photoshop, and whether now they can, they have a, a, they can do all this wonderful stuff with color, and maybe that's when publishers and artists realize that color does play an important role in comic book making. Even Sin City, too. Oh, yeah, yeah even Sin City. Yeah. yeah, it has the, the red, and it's mostly just, yeah, black and white, to make it have that noir feel. Now, you just mentioned about Watchmen, and one of the things with Watchmen was the way the story is told through the nine-panel grid. It's like a little uh, loving tribute to Steve Ditko. All right, so what's the, the nine-panel nine grid? The three-by-three three grid? Yeah. 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 yeah, no, no, you're right. So, so if you look at, like, the Watchmen comic book, even, like, the Dark Knight Returns, like, readers, you might not even notice it, but, like, all the panels are pretty much the same size, like, on every page. Sometimes... Dave Gibbons will expand it into two panels, so it's got that same beat. So when you're looking at a comic book page, uh, so if the panel's larger, your eye's gonna spend more time on that panel. If you have more dialogue there, your eye's gonna spend more time on that panel, so that moment's gonna last longer. So when you have panels that are all the same sort of size, it has that beat to it. And yeah, Dave Gibbons did that with Watchmen, and I, somebody told me that, um, yeah, The Dark Knight Returns is like that too, but if you're just reading it, you might not even notice it, but if you actually you know, look at it, and you're like, oh, well, that's pretty clever. Yeah, my, when somebody pointed out to me, I never noticed it, then I saw that. Yeah. And little things like that are the playful touches that an artist and a writer will create in what they do. With you guys, what is your favorite thing you've done on a page that, you know, like playfulness like that? Oh. I like to uh, kind of break the border and just have some characters just sit right on the top of the line of the border of the, whole, the entire page. I like that. You know, just uh, Toppy did that sometimes. <coughs> And like, uh, there wouldn't be any dialogue, but maybe like we'll see these characters and they'll, they'll be reacting. You know, and then maybe in the, the actual first panel, we'll see what they're reacting to. So I like to do that, play with the whole actual page as a design, not just uh, individual panels. I just got a shade of Deadpool as you're saying that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, would, he would do that. Oh, he would. Go oh, right. Yeah, I'm still collecting my thoughts. I, I think you're actually right about that, because there are some artists that, you know, it's not just the panel, it's the whole layout. Right. And what I was thinking about, like, I don't know about me, I mean, there's, like, lots of different types of stuff that I, I like to do. My storytelling is a little bit more simple. You know, I, I've had, well, one thing I was thinking about was, like, like two of the artists that have had a huge impact on me artistically and storytelling-wise, Jack Kirby and Will Eisner. And both those guys were geniuses, but their storytelling styles were so different from one another. Because Will had, like, a very simplistic kind of, like, uh, panel layout, and also if Will's stories were focused on an adult audience, he might get rid of like the panels around the, the, the boxes around the panels, even the word balloons. But Jack Kirby's stuff was so explosive, right? Because the characters are jumping out of the panels. So, and, and both those things are, both of those, those styles are, are awesome, but they were just so different from one another. I, I 
think as a writer it's a little bit different because I have to I think of the page differently, right? Like I'm I'm not a visual artist, so I'm, it's it's a much bigger jump for me. But there's definitely so a lot of times it's like um, the things that jump out at me is like so like when you do a nine panel grid, three by three grid, or anything above that. I mean that's an information based page to me as a writer. I'm like oh there's a lot of I'm getting nine panels of story. Like that's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of story in this. Which also tells me as a writer in another page or two, I need a splash page that's going to explode the story. Like if this is all the ignition, and then in two pages we're going to light it on fire. So the thing that I've been wrestling with and trying to figure out is like, can you get both? Can I get a set of pages that have a lot of information and story but still be the fire? And like, so there's a panel, there's a page, there's a splash page coming up in the last issue of Thumbs that I'm really proud of that it took a long time for Hayden and I to work on, where it's like the final face off between the good guy and the bad guy. But there's all these auxiliary stories that we need to tie up. So we conceived of it as a, like, you know, movie letter boxes? Yeah. So it's like, between the two pages, it's like there's a letter box, right? And so like the middle of that letter box, which in a movie would be like the main screen, is the face off and the battle. And then what we did is where the blacks, the negative space would be in a letterbox. And when I say letterbox, I mean when you watch movies where like the top and the bottom are black lines and then the image is just running in the middle. So where the black lines would normally go, we split those up into separate panels of all the auxiliary stories occurring. So you're seeing the face off and the war happen and what, what like all the consequences and the stakes of the war and all these mini panels on the top and the bottom. And that was one where it was like, it took us forever to figure out how to do both, but once we once we did, and once I saw it, I was like, oh, "We got it! <laughs> like this is amazing." So, it, it, so like I think in that, for as a writer, like because I can't think visually, a lot of times it's how do I communicate to the artist? Like, we we re how can we really need this to do both, and then and then hoping they don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other future things, uh, different directions, maybe ultimately where you want to go and. If it was totally up to you, and in some cases it is, what would you like to be uh, creating or working on, or at some point, not a bucket list, but some point, a dream game. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can, I can yeah, go ahead. All right, yeah, I'm sorry. Come on. Uh, <laughs> well, no, see, he knows. well, I do, and it, it's terrible. <laughs> no, 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 it's all serious. Enough. Like, um, I've been very blessed with my career, so I've done pretty much everything I wanted to, and it's a huge blessing, and I'm very happy for doing that, but if you're asking me what my favorite gig now, it's like working on that now. Uh, that just, uh, the sword of me just came out, I'm working on the sequel. That is so much joy there, because, you know, I don't have an editor tell me how to draw, uh, I don't have an editor tell me how, how to write, and I'm telling stories that I really want to tell, but so, but I have something to say, and that's what the most fun I have in comics. So, but I, I, but again, like I said, like I've had a wonderful, blessed career, so I was able to do all that other stuff, you know. I mean, I've, I've been really lucky. The, the first publisher that hired me was the publisher I always dreamed of working at. You know, like that, it rarely happens that way, but that's, it's just how it worked out, and it's become a really great relationship. So, like, I'd love to just keep working there, but my deep fantasy is like, I would love to create my own universe like at there, like superhero universe. Like I'd like to be Stan Lee. Like I'd love to like- With the mustache? With the mustache. And the khaki I, pants? I, the khaki yeah. pants, I want the sweaters. I want it all. <laughs> I want all of it. Hopefully in a year you'll see me like that. Uh, but yeah, no, I fantasize about all of that and making all the characters and having like, there's just something cool to me about like, oh, could, what would it be like to create this kind of shared universe? It's dumbfounding to me that like two dudes sat down in a room with Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and like 50 or 60 years later, all we spend our time talking about or watching in media is the things that they made. Like, it, it's unbelievable. So yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> oh boy, I guess I'll uh, just continue doing what I'm doing. I'm having an absolute blast with Blood Rum. Uh, the, the publisher, Peter Sametti, is he's totally down with my crazy, epic, dark fantasy saga that I have in store. And with every volume, I really try to challenge myself. Uh, it's very easy for certain writers and artists to say, you know what, I'm very comfortable here. I'm just going to stay right here. So for the next volume, uh, I'm trying to make it as different as possible. And so it's, people are in store for something wild. We'll see how it goes. It's, it's hell for me, but it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll open it up to any, any questions. The only thing I was going to suggest is that if there is, or anybody here knows of anybody who would like to head into this direction for a career or otherwise, 
any any suggestions, tips, or advice you might want to pass on? Make a book. Like just start making books. Like people ask all the time, like how do you get in the business? How do you get in the business? Like there's a like some weird magic like lock to it. One almost everyone's story of how they got into the business or where they are is very different, but there's very few of them that I've ever heard that don't start with I worked with a friend and I made a book or I wrote and drew my own like you know, small comic, like one page comic. Like I just think make, making things and getting better is is the constant. Yeah, I think you're right. The product happens first. You gotta love doing it, and when you produce work, then people will come. But since I also teach, you know, we talk about the business side of work in comics and animation as well. So you, you gotta love doing what you're doing. You gotta keep at it. And you have to be persistent because, like, even if you want to work for all these huge publishers, you're gonna get tons, dozens of um, rejection letters. But you gotta keep at it, and then things will work out fine. But you gotta keep. Loving what you're doing and keep uh, creating the work. And then you have to also be a very smart business person. We were talking about that earlier. You got to learn how. You no, know, you do. Like, cause there's a lot of artists that just want to write and draw, and that's totally cool. But if you want to have a successful, uh, you know, career in anything that's competitive or in entertainment, you got to be a smart business person. I don't know how to submit work, and I got to have to understand how contracts work and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, if it's any consolation, I mean. Uh Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the creators of Superman, were rejected for five years. And the creator of Dick Tracy had been submitting uh, ideas to the newspapers. He was rejected for 10. Until finally they said, this Dick Tracy thing is awesome. Let's roll with that. And then there you go. He didn't stop. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we want to open it up to the uh, viewing audience if there's any other questions. Isn't it true that you submitted a book, Sean? Uh, to Marvel, uh, what was it, 12 years ago now? Maybe even longer ago. 2000. Just right tell us a little bit about that book. Huh? I didn't submit a book. There was a contest. So it was 2000. I don't know why. I don't know if Marvel was doing it. You guys would probably know the history of this better or not. It was right when I was out of college. You remember this because I was sleeping on your couch, on your dad's couch for like most of that year. And... Um, I, yeah, they, I was, I, my background's in theater. I had been writing plays and I'd had a little bit, clearly not a lot of success at that point. I've had more since. Um, they had a contest for, for writing comic books. I sent them in a couple of play ideas. They, they didn't like them. <laughs> but it's right when they hired like Robert Aguiar Sacasa, who's also a playwright. Yeah, and uh, he worked on, I believe, uh, Fantastic Four for the Marvel Knights line. Right, exactly. So I think whatever they were doing was tied to that because he came out of that at that at that moment. Yeah, there's no one else to ask. Him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, all right, so so I guess to, to to branch the question off to everybody else, uh, what's your biggest failure and what did you learn from it in the industry? What was like the worst thing that happened to you in the comic book industry and what did you learn from it? I was right in. Yeah, I was in immediately. <laughs> no, see, I got to be very careful with what I say because I don't want to. No, no, no. I mean, I don't want to because I because I got to be I, I do have to be careful because I don't want to like there are fans of certain publishers and comics and I don't want to sort of like uh, kill any of that. I think. Uh, I guess what I would say that the worst thing I ever. I think the worst thing I ever did. I, I think no, or that happened to me. I I think pro oh. <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot there's of things going through my mind. There, there, there are there, there are plenty. So there, there, you're, 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 there, there there's your most painful your most painful failure. I think he understands. I think this no, is no, no, no. Still no, no. I gotta I gotta see. The, I gotta I gotta pick one. Um, all right. He, this this is when I when I first started working in comics. It's, it's before I started working on Elf Quest. You punched Stanley. No. <laughs> Actually, I may have done that. Um, uh, there was an inker by the name of... I probably shouldn't say his name. Uh, and I, I met him, and he needed... He had assistants inking the backgrounds of his books. Uh, this is before I started working for ElfQuest. And he hired me to... And it was the only assistant job I ever did to work on a Bugs Bunny story for DC. It was six pages long. So I inked all the backgrounds. I got no credit, of course. And he inked all the main figures. So when he got the artwork back from me, he started complaining, started ripping everything apart, saying how terrible it was. And he gave me less money. He gave me a kill for you. That's the only thing that, that's the only time that ever happened to me. Only time I ever did assistant work. When the book came out and I looked at the artwork, he didn't change anything. So yeah. And the other thing is like the arch, the, the contract I signed with Archie Comics is terrible. 
other than that, you know, I think. But everything else has been wonderful. There's like, I've worked with a lot of wonderful people. I've had a wonderful career. I've done all the things I really wanted to do. But that goes to the conversation we're talking about, like the business side of things. You just got to be a smart business person. Yeah, I guess it was more of a learning experience. When I was starting out, no one taught me about contracts, and we were talking about this briefly. Um, I did work for a, com a company that's not around anymore, Moonstone Books. Uh, for about a year and a half, I worked on this book, and I signed a contract that I would get paid when the book would be in print. They were basically bringing back all these 1930s characters, like the Phantom, Secret Agent X, uh, the Shadow, and all these guys. And then the company did really bad in 2010, and basically folded. And I never got any payment for that work because it, was, it wasn't in print. So that was a big learning lesson. So to read that contract, protect yourself, because you don't want to get cash up front. Exactly. John, <laughs> <laughs> any failures? Oh, a ton. This is a ton. I mean, so many. I mean, the contracts is a big one. The contracts are often bad. Um, <laughs> which doesn't mean you can't negotiate them. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to other collaborators or other people in the business. Like, like actually, things like this I think are great for us because we get together and we're like, hey, what did you hear about that publisher? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, well, when you see us talking to each other, that's literally what the whole thing is. Oh, no, what I was going to say is like, when I sort of worked for Archie Comics, one of the other Archie Comics guys said that Archie does not like it when other freelancers talk to one another because they talk about this stuff and they talk about page rates and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so they frown. What, is, what a horrible thing for us oh, to yeah. do. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, my, my the, in comics, I mean, the big failures... Um, I mean, the big one was when my first book came out, Saints, I really thought that it was going to be, like, fame and fortune immediately, which shows how little I knew about the industry at all. Um, like we had a grand plan of like we'll be doing this for years and making so much and then by our third issue We got a phone call that said like you guys are probably canceled like we'll let you keep doing it up until about nine issues But it's over and we were like, okay <laughs> um, And so yeah, you know, like I think uh, I Don't know. I don't know necessarily what I learned from it um, If anything it just I guess what I learned from it is I was like I still really love doing this and so like literally like a week later I went on Facebook to like, Boom Studios is this comic book company and they had this submission page and I didn't know how to find an artist. Um, the artist on Saints was a friend of mine and he didn't want to do comics after we got canceled. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I need to find more artists and Boom Studios had this weird submission page that I don't think they ever looked at. So I scrolled through it and the next two comic books that I did, Coyotes and The Few, I found the artist for that on the same weekend and contacted them and we did these books that have been way more successful. So. Perseverance, I mean, is, is good. And also knowing if you want to go through the ups and downs of this, because the downs do suck. <laughs> I'll give you, I got out a smile. <laughs> um, just one thing I happen to think of, Al, you, you mentioned ElfQuest. Did you get to work with or deal with directly Richard or Wendy Peeney and all the time that they've had that out? Yes. <laughs> we'll stop. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yes, period. Yeah, I can't comment more on that. <laughs> no, and I'm not even trying to be funny either. Because so. sometimes I guess you don't, and depending on what the title is and the publisher, you don't necessarily get to deal with the, the, the actual creators of a character. And I didn't know what you know, that experience could be like or not like if it's going through channels or, or whatever. I've only met them a couple of times myself at a couple of shows, I think Hudson Valley and Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. And that's been, they've been very nice, pleasant. In my, my Did you buy a book? For my wife's cousin's husband, no, my wife and uh, or rather her cousin and husband are been big fans because they're they live in the same area. They they have had a lot of Elfquest stuff. Oh, all right, do you want me to say whatever. something nice about Richard Pini? I can actually say something nice about Richard Pini. Um, no, I, I I'm happy that you know I started my career really working for uh, uh, Warp Graphics. It's not black, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that that was nice. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes it's difficult working with publishers, all right? But the nice thing about Richard is that uh, he was at a convention up in Poughkeepsie, was yeah. it? Yeah, right, so true. some of my students went up there. Richard Pini had a table. Uh, they bought one of um, Richard Pini's trade paperbacks, and they mentioned that they were students of mine. And Richard Pini signed the book to my students and to Al Nickerson. So that was actually quite nice. So that I do appreciate. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So, you guys talked about, like, what was your first comic and everything, but is there any, like, specific um, individual in the comic industry that you, like, looked up to or 
um, somebody that like mentored you or anything similar? He didn't mentor me, but his career was incredibly inspiring. Todd McFarlane. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, just how he just went off, did his own thing, and how he's he knew that he had to be a businessman. You know, that's that's something that I, I really uh, I learned from. He also has great taste in comic shops. Really? We have a video of him saying that he loves Haven for Heroes. That's ah. awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Sure. Uh, well, I, I would probably have to mention Will Eisner. Um, I didn't know much of Will Eisner's work when I was in high school, but when I went to college, and he was one of my teachers for three and a half years, or three years, um, that, yeah, he was a, a great mentor, and he was just a wonderful guy. So, but like, in those days, it was kind of like, yeah, it's just Will, you know? And then, you're, and then you realize the impact he has on comics, and he was wonderful, so he was a wonderful teacher and a mentor. I mean, I think on the business level, all of the image founders are, are huge to me, and I go back. There's a couple documentaries that came out on them because of their 25th anniversary that whenever I'm really depressed about the business, I just sit down and I watch, I watch them. Because um, I'm just like, right, they did it. They're here, yeah, we can do it. Um, and then as a writer, you know, Claremont still sticks with me. Like, what he was able to do with the X-Men for so long, like seven, 17 years or something. Yeah is just unbelievable and how he brought this like human element to all of those characters. And Warren Ellis is another person who I look at who's just kind of done his career the way he wants to do his career. And I think that's the big thing for me, I, I, probably for all of us, I mean, we're all doing independent books, is that there's a level of like, I wanna do this my own way. You know, so those are the people who jump out as like, yeah, that's somebody to kind of follow. Now who's like a non-comic book influence you guys have for what you do? John Lennon, love his music. <laughs> such a peaceful, such a peaceful musician for a guy who writes a book called Blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, he also wrote uh, My Mummy's Dead. So That's true. <laughs> the duality of man. There you go. Um, I think a big influence on me is uh, there was a theater director in the '70s and '80s in New York called Joseph Papp, who he started the Free Shakespeare in the Park in New York City uh, and the New York. Shakespeare Festival, public theater. Just like, he was really socially inclined, he was very much about like, how do we make access to people, and also he did, he was like a badass, like he did it all on his own. Like, there was all these Broadway theaters and they wouldn't do a certain type of work, and so he took over the public and was like, you know, like seeing Shakespeare done this way or with this type of people or a diversity of cast, he's like, I'll fund it myself, and he would just kind of do it. It's very punk rock DIY. Hugely, yeah, for sure. Well, like all the, all the guys that I'm thinking about also draw comics. I was thinking of like Bruce Tim, but he also does, you know, animation, he draws comics. I was thinking of uh, Joss Whedon, but he also wrote, also you know, comics. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I got nothing. Uh, other, <laughs> other, than, other than those guys, you know, primarily they were, you know, like Bruce Tim was an animator, a storyboard artist, right? But yeah, he actually worked in comics. And Joss Whedon is like a fantastic writer, but then he had to run on... Astonishing X Men, I think. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go to the delegation. I think we can go with uh, Josh for that one. All right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a great writer. So I have one more question. Um, so now, like, I guess the opposite. What is? Um, we don't necessarily have to name names of people or stuff, but like a series or like a run of a certain comic that you thought was just overrated or just not as good as everyone or the general thinks. I'm curious. I'm not answering that. <laughs> There's no way. No need for negativity. I will flip the question though and say like, Something I missed when I was younger that I've been reading obsessively is Walter Simonson's run on Thor. Oh, okay. Like, which is like the beginning of Better A Bill. Like, I've been reading that, like, non-stop lately. And it was out when I was a kid, and I was always like, Thor's stupid. I don't care about the blonde guy. And then, like, I've been, re I've been reading this, and I'm like, I'm stupid. Like, this is amazing. Okay, then, so then maybe change it to something you thought was overrated that you turned out to love. And I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't. Nothing comes to mind. Really. That's fine. I will say that Preacher is one of my favorite series ever. Very good one. Uh, Garth Ennis is my favorite comic writer. Punisher Max, in my opinion, is Punisher done right. Even when he does the Marvel Knights Punisher, yeah. like it's it's a whole different feel. It's amazing how he can just go from dark, serious, gritty, steeped in realism, then 
you know, have him just fighting superheroes in another one. So he's, he's fantastic. And the run on Punisher Max, I encourage you, it's, it's incredible. And we also wouldn't have uh, Garth's, uh, we wouldn't have The Boys on Amazon Prime. Exactly. It's a great show. Great, 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 great series, too. Great series. Yeah. Uh, this question was sort of asked, but since we're in a library, I was wondering if you had a non-illustrated book influence or recommendations. Fiction or non-fiction? Uh, I'm, I'm currently reading, I'm, I'm more than halfway through Dune, the original, by Herbert, and it's, it's unbelievable. Wow. Master world builder. Fantastic. Thumbs, I was doing a lot of sci-fi research, so like Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said by Philip K. Dick has been one that I've been reading and rereading a lot. Well, there's a lot of prose that I like. I, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity, which is fantastic. There was a book that came out like last fall called Stuff Said. It was like the Jack Kirby, Stan Lee stuff, which you could, if you ever read that, you could probably understand what I'm talking about. Um, there was a book called Eisner Miller where um, Frank Miller went down to visit Will Eisner before he passed away and they had a long conversation over the course of a weekend oh, really? and that was all transcribed so uh, that was, I, I read a lot of, you know, a lot of the pros I'm reading nowadays it's, it's based on the comic book industry, you know, so stuff like that I, I like. Um, That's cool, I have to find that. What's it called? Uh, Eisner Miller. You might have to write it down. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. But the, but the thing is, like, this is right when, when Frank Miller finished uh, DK2, so he was really tired when he went down to see Will for that weekend, and Will, I don't think, really did his research on Frank Miller, even though they were friendly and stuff. So they're kind of like going, and Will was always very, very much a debater, so they were kind of going back and forth a lot, you know? So, But they, they talk about everything in comics in that whole book, like how to make comics, the industry, and everything else, and it's, it is, it, it's quite wonderful. And I'm waiting for Char uh, Charles Brownstein, to who, who recorded to actually put the audio out, you know, and see, yeah, that would be great. I don't know if I'll ever do it that long. Uh, hey, if you know the questions, we're, we're good. Uh, I want to thank you guys for, for doing this. Don't forget to check out the table again. Robert Geronimo, Sean Lewis, and Al Nickerson. Thank you so much. Thank you.